G'day, I'm Holden Shepherd. I'm a novelist, freelance writer and live storyteller. And in this mini lecture, I'm going to talk about genre in relation to literature. So as humans, one of the first things we do to understand something is to define and categorize it. So we ask ourselves, what kind of thing is this? And when it comes to literature, a book's type is called its genre. It comes from the French word genre, which just means type or sort. So a genre is basically a, a set of shared expectations between the writer and the reader. And this means that I can walk into a bookshop and without having to open the pages or read the blurb or even look at the title, if I'm told the genre of a book, I have an understanding in my head of what the expectations will be of that particular book. For instance, if it's a crime novel, I understand there'll probably be a murder, an investigation, a detective, and uh, hopefully a resolution uh, to the mystery at the end. Likewise, with a romance, I know there's going to be two people falling in love, probably falling out of love, and at the end, I'm hoping for a happily ever after. And this goes so on and so forth for any genre, action, thriller, fantasy, sci-fi, even literary fiction. They all have their set of shared expectations that must be met. In a way, I think of genre as a promise from the writer to the reader, telling them what to expect. And this is really important when you're writing something, because it means that you, as the writer, have to deliver. So if a reader doesn't like what you're delivering, if you don't follow through on your promise of what your genre is going to be, you'll end up with very disappointed and dissatisfied readers and likely a very, very short career as a writer uh, because your books won't sell. So genre is vitally, vitally important. So category is just where the market is going to place your book in terms of the age range that the readers are going to be. So there's junior fiction for kids under the age of eight, middle grade for eight to 12, young adult from 12 to 18, and then above 18 is just uh, fiction for adults. The reason I'm mentioning category is that young adult is technically a category. However, it follows so many of the similar restrictions and expectations of a genre that when people ask me what genre my book is, I say Invisible Boys is a contemporary young adult novel. The reason is uh, so many uh, restrictions around age and what's appropriate for certain ages define what readers will expect to take place in that book and what's gonna be okay and not okay. So it's really important to understand your category as well as your genre. And you can have things like uh, genre on top of category. So you can have a middle grade fantasy or a YA suspense, for example. Um, these things occur simultaneously. So I guess firstly, the way Invisible Boys meets the expectations of the YA genre is the theme and subject matter. So thematically, it's all intact. So if you pick up a book for young adults and it's contemporary fiction, realist, you have everything you'd expect. You have teenage characters who are 16 years old, three boys, Zeke, Charlie and Hammer. You have a coming of age narrative where they're growing from being boys, they're losing their innocence, they're becoming men and they're defining themselves in relation to the world externally to them. All the themes and issues that you would expect teenagers to live through on the daily, which they are every day, um, are in the book. So things like first love, first kiss, first sex, first alcohol, house parties, family tensions, friend tensions, rejection, school, everything is in there. Um, even mental health is, is uh, foregrounded to a large extent. So everything I think defines contemporary young adult and what you would expect of it is put into this book thematically first of all. So some of the elements I used to uh, encapsulate the young adult genre within my book Invisible Boys were style and point of view. So something I made a very conscious choice to do was to put the book in first person. So first person point of view using the I voice. And I chose to do this because firstly, it gave each character their own distinct voice. So you got to hear from Zeke, Charlie and Hammer in their own words. Um, the first person for me brings an immediacy and a closeness to that character that I find third person can't quite achieve. Um, but also it reflects for me the, the level of self-involvement that we have. Um, I know when I was a teenager, you know, everything I was feeling felt like uh, it was so important and so vital and it was the end of the world um, if it was a bad thing and it was the best thing in the world if it was a good thing. So having it set in first person and written in that way brought that closeness and that immediacy to the feelings and also that self-involvement. Uh, moreover, I wrote this book in present tense instead of past. So I used to write only in past tense. Uh, for this book I changed to present because when you write in the present tense as things are currently happening, I find it lends a real urgency to the book. I also found that when I read something in past tense, I think to myself, well, this has already happened in the past. So I know it has a resolution and I know it, and I know it kind of comes to an end at some point because it's happened already. Um, writing in present tense just gives you that sense that this is currently happening. These events are unfolding right now as the characters are talking about them. So it makes you feel like you're right there with them. And the reviewers who have talked about the 
velocity of the prose in my book, um, I believe have commented on that because that's what I was trying to achieve. I was trying to make uh, the reader want to keep persevering through this, to keep turning the page because you feel like it's happening and unfolding right before your eyes. Uh, and certainly that's how it feels for me uh, when I was a teenager. It felt like everything was happening very intensely and very quickly. The other element to this was the letter bombs. So I have a series of anonymous letters woven through the three narrative strands in my novel. And these letter bombs were initially written um, in a way called stream of consciousness. So what that is is that you're basically dumping every single thought that comes into the character's brain and letting them kind of unleash in a way that's free from punctuation and structure and, and, and anything. So those letter bombs in the novel are written in a way to depict how it feels to be a teenager in a mental health crisis. You know, this is what it feels like and it's a very um, unfettered process where there's no kind of structure and you feel like you're out of control and to me that's how things felt for me and that's how I wanted the, the character to feel and how the readers, um, I hoped, would respond. So these were elements I used to really bring forward the energy and the intensity of the teenage experience into this book. The other element I wanted to focus on in Invisible Boys was the dialogue. So for me it was really important that if I'm writing teenagers that the dialogue has to sound authentically teenage. Since I am not a teenager anymore myself, I, I thought briefly about asking my nieces and nephews about, you know, what's the current slang? Uh, but I decided against that. I decided that me trying to keep up with the trends would come across as inauthentic. So instead I looked more holistically at, well, what have teenagers always been like across generations? What doesn't change? And what doesn't change is the sense of irreverence, the sense of uh, being larrikins and the sense of using some form of slang. So I wanted to incorporate that into the dialogue and there's a certain level of unpreciousness to the way that these characters speak that for me feels authentically teenage. I also wanted to bring in some colloquialisms as well. So my three boys are living in Geraldton, which is set in the Midwest of Western Australia. So it's an isolated uh, regional town. So it was important for me to have these Aussie elements. I didn't want to kind of make it uh, generic or uh, sound like it could be potentially American. This is a very Aussie and West Aussie kind of story. So I wanted to bring that through with the dialogue. I also didn't, didn't want to make it uh, to Steve Irwin. You know, there's not like blokes and sheilas everywhere. Uh, so I wanted to make sure there was a fine balance between it sounding real and it sounding like a caricature. So I, I, hopefully that's something that uh, I could make happen here. Um, and hopefully it ended up a little bit less Crocodile Dundee and more Kath and Kim. Uh, I also included swearing in this book and that was important to me for a number of reasons. But basically, teenagers swear. And sometimes parents and teachers don't like that, but it's a reality. So I wanted to show that this is how it goes down. However, I needed to be careful of a few things around this. So my initial manuscript had uh, about 30 uh, C words in the manuscript and over 100 F bombs. And what I had to do in this process was negotiate the fine line between being real and being authentic and also being too graphic. Because the YA genre, the expectation that we have around that, is that yes, it's, it's uh, appropriate for teenagers, but also there are adult gatekeepers around this. So there are teachers, uh, parents, heads of English, um, librarians, booksellers, all kinds of people who decide whether or not they're going to put a book into a teenager's hands or get it into a school or into a classroom or a library. So you have to actually weigh up the realities of that. And so my publisher said, look, we want to make sure that this book reaches the people who want to read it. We want to make sure this reaches young adults. So we had to pare back a little bit. We had to keep, I had to keep the swearing, I wanted to keep the swearing for authenticity. So we retained some of those C-bombs and F-bombs, but we reduced it right down so it wasn't so gratuitous. So this is one of the characteristics and, and expectations of the genre of YA that have to be met in order for that book to actually succeed. My advice for young writers who are uh, writing anything in any genre is that if you're going to write your genre, you need to know your genre, you need to understand it. And the way to do that is to read in your genre. So the first reason for that is that by reading your genre, you'll understand what's already being done. You'll understand the expectations. As a reader, you'll develop a connection with that genre. So if you're writing high fantasy, start reading high fantasy. And you'll realise what feels good when they do it right. And what makes you feel disappointed at the end of a high fantasy novel when they do it wrong. So you'll start to understand what the genre needs and what your readers, like you, are going to start to expect. But the second part of this is that once you have a good sense of what's already happening in your genre, you can then find new ways to get your voice into that genre. So a lot of publishers will talk about the fact that you know, there's no new stories as such. Most stories have been done in some form previously. But what publishers and agents always look for is new voices, 
new ways, fresh approaches of coming at these stories with new angles. So if you read extensively in your genre, you'll understand what's already been done and you'll find the gaps. For me with Invisible Boys, there were certainly coming out stories, there were certainly stories about Aussie teenagers, but I hadn't found anything that combined them both in a way that was set in a country town around three you know, very unstereotypical gay boys. So for me, it was important to find that niche and it helped me find my voice and the way that I could contribute something original to this genre. So if you're writing, I would encourage you to do the same. Know your genre, understand its expectations, and then work out which way you're gonna bring your fresh voice into the world.